Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be discovering some of the new things NASA learned about one of the most incredible stars out there, the star known as Eta Carina. One of the most incredible, most unusual, most massive and most, a lot of other things, stars in our galaxy. With this right here not really being the star itself, this is known as the Homunculus Nebula, the object produced by the star. And so today we're going to talk a little bit more about Eta Carina, its history and what we can expect from it in the next few decades. But first of all, let's start by figuring out where all of this is located. Now the name itself, Carina, is actually also the name of a very famous and extremely bright nebula. As a matter of fact, in one of the previous videos from a few years ago, I tried to navigate across the galaxy using visual cues and one of the ways I was able to find our solar system and to find the Earth eventually was by actually starting right here. I started by looking for Carina Nebula and that's the bright object you see we're coming toward right now. This nebula is extremely bright and it's also extremely massive. It also contains quite a lot of different stars, quite a lot of star forming regions and overall represents a pretty incredible formation. But somewhere right there at the center, you'll see that there's another object we're going toward. That's the Eta Carina. The object that can be best described as a smaller nebula produced by some of the most massive stars in the galaxy. And the thing is, this star was not particularly famous until 1843, when it suddenly became the second brightest star in the night skies. And that's because for one reason or another, over 150 years ago, it began the first of many eruptions that followed afterwards. Something inside the star system caused it to suddenly increase in brightness. In the process, throwing off huge amounts of material, creating the nebula that we refer to as the Homunculus Nebula. And this is an extremely powerful process. It's actually unbelievably powerful. As a matter of fact, the amount of material that was thrown off in the last, I guess, 160, 170 years or so, the material that ended up creating the nebula represents over 30 masses of the sun up to possibly even 60 masses of the sun. As a matter of fact, the stuff here is so thick that it's practically impossible to see through it, making the stars on the inside invisible. And the only thing that is visible are actually the re-emissions of different types of light created by the nebula around it, mixed with certain types of very powerful light that do get through the entire cloud. And so even though it's so far away from us, 7500 light years away, it's still quite visible because of the brightness. But more importantly, over the years, the scientists realized that it's actually two stars. There is one really massive star, something known as the LBV, also known as Luminous Blue Variable Star, that has a mass of anywhere from 90 to maybe even 150 masses of the Sun, but a star that's emitting so much material from its surface that it most likely also lost approximately 30 masses of the Sun in the last 150 years. And then there is also a slightly smaller partner, the star known as Eta Carina b. And the stars seem to orbit around one another in a relatively eccentric way every five and a half years. The second star is most likely what's known as the O-type star, with a mass of anywhere from 30 to 80 masses of the Sun. And as you can imagine, because of the emissions and the masses of these stars, they're basically coming to an end. They're going to be going supernova relatively soon. The bigger star will go supernova first, and this might happen within the next 2 to 3 million years, although the actual fate of the star is still not entirely certain. It might go supernova, it might just completely collapse into a black hole, or it might produce some kind of a hypernova producing even more energy. It will all depend on how much mass is left at the end. And one of the main reasons why there is so much uncertainty about these stars is really because we can't see them. They're hidden by the clouds, by the homunculus nebula. Which is why even their mass is not entirely known. But nevertheless, this was still a relatively bright star for many decades after the initial eruption. At some point, it was even used in navigation simply because it was so easily visible. But because this is such a unique object and because there are no other objects like this one anywhere else in the galaxy or in any of the nearby galaxies, it actually makes Eta Carina one of the most interesting stars to study or to talk about. So, for example, one of the most peculiar features is of course the nebula that it created. And because of this nebula and because of its thickness, and because it's also hiding a lot of the emissions from the star, 
it actually blocks most of the light that used to illuminate Carina Nebula. Which means that back in the days, I guess over 200 years ago, Carina Nebula might have been much 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 brighter and very likely appeared as something absolutely incredible to some of the ancient astronomers. But since the eruption in 1840s, the nebula covered most of the brightness of the star and so now pretty much most of the illumination only comes from the small region we refer to as the homunculus. And this object is interesting in its own right. For example, its shape is difficult to explain. For some reason, the eruption seemed to have ejected most of the material in the somewhat polar directions. Basically, most of the material seems to be above the latitude of about 45 degrees, which obviously created the shape that we see here. But why this happened is not certain right now. At the same time, it seems that the entire loops here were only formed through that one eruption in the 40s, 1840s, whereas additional eruptions that followed afterwards did not really contribute much to anything here. Even though several other eruptions were observed afterwards, for the most part, they must have stayed on the inside. Although here I guess one explanation is that the original eruption produced the material moving slightly faster, so it's just always ahead of everything else whereas the additional eruptions are basically causing the internal part still being relatively opaque and explain why we can't really see the stars themselves even after essentially almost 200 years. Although interestingly enough, the new models suggest that the eruption seems to be progressing relatively fast. And it also means that within the next few decades, the material here will most likely stop being so opaque, allowing the scientists to finally see the stars on the inside. In other words, within the next few decades, all of this might actually dissipate and for the first time the scientists might be able to see the stars, watching the stars orbit around one another and allowing the scientists to finally figure out what's actually happening inside the homunculus nebula. For example, one question that the scientists currently have no idea how to answer is why exactly did the star start emitting so much material? This is a luminous blue variable star and most of them do not do this. This seems to be the only star with these emissions. Or more exact, it's one of the very few LBVs. Some of the most massive ones seem to be doing it once in a while, but never really to the same extent as we see in this particular case. For example, is this something that's only caused because of the partner? Or is this something that only happens very very briefly and then sort of stops completely after a while? And also, is this something that might have actually created most of the nebula we see around us? For example, where exactly did the rest of the material in the Carina nebula come from? Could it be coming from the same star? Now that's probably unlikely, but the scientists would still like to try to answer some of these questions in regards to the origin of certain nebula and of course the actual activity inside these stars. But now, only a few weeks ago from when I'm making this video, the NASA scientists along with several other collaborators were able to create the most accurate 3D model of the entire system. And this is actually based on observations from various telescopes using very different frequencies. In this particular case, it includes the visible light, it also includes the very powerful ultraviolet light that seems to be coming from a lot of different directions, various types of hydrogen emissions from the hydrogen cloud around the nebula, the very energetic X-ray emissions which seem to be present both inside the homunculus nebula and also around it, and extremely bright infrared light that's produced by the cloud itself as a lot of these emissions interact with the gas inside it, allowing the scientists to create this multi-wavelength model. And this is something you can actually explore by yourself, either on your phone or your browser, by using the link that NASA provided. This is known as ViewSpace, and it's essentially an interactive system that allows us to learn more about space by using various simulations. For example, here's visible light, we have ultraviolet light, we have X-rays, and then we have the multi-wavelength observations, with the infrared light looking like a typical hourglass. And this is part of NASA's Universe of Learning initiative that tries to teach the public about various types of objects out there in the universe. Although this is something that they're still developing, so there are not a lot of objects to choose from. The link for this is, as always, in the description below. But while studying these emissions, especially X-ray emissions, some of the other telescopes and other studies have also discovered that this particular location or this particular star system also seems to produce gamma rays. 
And that's of course not something that we expect from a typical star system. Which of course suggests that this is such a ridiculously powerful system that it seems to produce all of the wavelengths, including gamma rays, the most powerful types of wavelengths we observe, in huge abundance. With the peak usually being every five and a half years because of the orbit of the stars in the middle. And interestingly enough, none of this right now has any explanation, or at least a good explanation. For the most part, this is the most mysterious star system in our galaxy. And because this is also an actively evolving star system and doesn't seem to have any parallels anywhere near us, basically the only such star system we know of, it will be extremely interesting to follow the system for the next few decades just to see how it changes and what it ends up doing. So expect a lot more videos and a lot more stories about the star system and what we find inside the Homunculus Nebula. Although since we don't even know what the actual future of the star is, at this point, it's anyone's guess. When it comes to mysteries of the universe, this is as mysterious as it gets. Well, for now, that's all I wanted to mention. Check out all of the relevant links in the description below, subscribe, maybe share this video with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.